<laughs> we now call People versus Lavelle Sharp. May I proceed? Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, my name is Syed A. Huda, and I represent defendant appellant Lavelle Charles Sharp. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. That's fine. This court should reverse the decision of the Court of Appeals in its entirety for three reasons. Number one, the trial court did not abuse its discretion in excluding evidence of the complainant's lack of sexual conduct. After all, if the court permits a defendant to cross-examine a complainant on his or her sexual past, it frustrates the purpose of the rape shield statute. Or, if the trial court prohibits this cross-examination, it deprives his constitutional right to confront his witness. Neither outcome is acceptable. Number two, the trial court did not abuse its discretion in excluding evidence of DM's abortion. The record simply does not support any of the two alleged incidents at issue is the source of DM's pregnancy, making it irrelevant under Rule 401. The abortion is also unfairly prejudicial under Rule 403 because people hold widely different and deeply held beliefs about that particular topic. And number three, evidence of DM's pregnancy is irrelevant under Rule 401 for the same reasons the abortion is irrelevant. Again, the record does not support any of the two alleged incidents at issue is the source of DM's pregnancy. Thus, the pregnancy is not incident to any of the alleged crimes and is thus subject to exclusion under the rape shield statute. At this point, I invite the court's questions. The first point I would like to address is the standard of review here. Here, the standard of review is abuse of discretion and the trial court simply did not abuse its discretion in excluding evidence of the prior uh, lack of prior sexual conduct. And there are good reasons why. If the trial court did uh, admit evidence of prior, uh, a lack of prior sexual conduct, it would have opened a Pandora's box. At that point, it would have invited defense counsel to cross-examine the complainant on her lack of prior sexual conduct and that would subvert the purpose of the rape shield statute, which was designed to avoid that line of inquiry altogether. But, but the statute actually says evidence of specific instances of the victim's sexual conduct. And you want us to take those words and, and, and interpret them to mean that means no evidence of lack of sexual conduct? In res, um, Your Honor, the word conduct actually is not defined in the statute, so we consult dictionaries to help us with that and the word conduct at least according to black's law includes the lack of conduct and if you're worried and if your honor is worried about the word specific i think it would be a mistake to place too much of an emphasis on that word to place too much of an emphasis on that word would read a specificity threshold into the statute that just wouldn't make sense it would imply that you need a certain level of specificity to be excluded under the statute. Well, then what, what meaning would you give to the word specific? I think, Your Honor, if you look at the, the rest of the statute, it says uh, specific instances of sexual conduct, reputation evidence, and opinion evidence. So there is a continuum of evidence that is contemplated by the statute. It is not the only kind of uh, conduct that, or evidence that would be excluded reputation and opinion evidence, quite frankly, are not specific instances of sexual conduct. I, I'm, I'm still trying to understand what meaning you want to give to the word specific. I think the word specific uh, just means evidence of 
of, of, of prior sexual conduct, which includes the lack of sexual conduct. And quite frankly, Your Honor, um, I do think, I think we should keep in mind that Michigan was the first rape shield statute to be enacted in 1974. And other states have followed Michigan's example and have changed the, the wording specific and just replaced it with prior sexual conduct. So I do think it's probably an example of um, an inartful drafting at the outset. But I think the word conduct does include the lack of conduct as well. And there is a good reason why that reading uh, comports with the purpose of the statute. I mean, if we include or admit evidence of lack of sexual conduct, then that just allows uh, the defense counsel to really go after the complainant, and we just don't want that to happen. Um, alternatively, if the defendant is prohibited from cross-examining the complainant, then that really cross, uh, infringes upon his constitutional right to, to cross-examine, uh, to confrontation. Um, additionally, at that point, the lack of prior sexual conduct becomes an irrefutable fact. And moving forward, that would mean that any time a complainant says that he or she did not engage in any prior sexual conduct, that just becomes an, an irrefutable fact that nobody can contest moving forward. But would you object to the alternative? If, if in fact, um, the court allows the testimony, um, but also, therefore, because of the Sixth Amendment, allows your client to cross-examine, is there anything wrong with, with that outcome? There is, Your Honor, because at that point, we'll be veering away from the ultimate question at issue in the case is whether the alleged incidents took place. And if we allow the defense to cross-examine a complainant on the lack of prior sexual conduct, well, at that point, it's going to be, you know, who were you seeing two years before? Who were you um, baiting three years before? Let's look at your social media profile to see whether it is true um, that you did not engage in lack of prior sexual conduct, which really becomes more difficult at that point for the juries to sift through all this evidence more difficult for trial judges at that point to come up with, um, with you know, stipulations and, and limiting instructions as to what the jury may consider certain pieces of evidence for, um, and just take up a lot more time than is necessary at this point. Um, in this case, there were two alleged incidents at issue, and the jury needs to figure out whether they actually happened or not. But I, but I, but I think my, but my point has, I mean, I think you started this, so if the, if in fact, you know, the prosecutor wants to wants the uh, victim to be able to testify about a pregnancy and an abortion and the lack of other sexual partners, which would support evidence of guilt against your client. I don't see how a court could then prevent your client from cross-examining if there were questions that undermine that. I mean, is there any way the Sixth Amendment would allow anything else? No, I, I agree. I mean, at that point, the Sixth Amendment and the statute would, would permit um, cross-examination on all those points. I think the additional concern we have to worry about is what was the purpose of the statute to begin with? And the purpose of the statute was to really say, let's do away with this line of inquiry altogether. So the Sixth Amendment really comes in and saves the day, but at the same point, we are subverting uh, the purpose of the statute, and that's that's a consideration this court should consider. Uh, and with respect to the abortion, I mean, the trial court uh, simply did not abuse its discretion, and um, I mean, its its decision to exclude evidence of the abortion does not fall outside the range of principled outcomes here. So, if you think about abortion, I mean, that is a very controversial topic, and people will hold very strong and deeply held beliefs about it, political, religious, uh, cultural. And quite frankly, it is irrelevant um, at this point because this record does not support that any of the alleged incidents um, is the source of that abortion. Um, and similarly, with respect to... Uh, when you look at the testimony, or I mean, the evidence, the pieces of evidence, it seems to me... In, when you talk about starting with the pregnancy, again, it, isn't your position, don't, don't you take it a little too far when you say it's not probative evidence at all of the uh, charges in this case? I, I mean, think, Your Honor... something, right? It proves something. 
It is certainly probative of guilt, but I don't think that uh, it's probative of guilt. It's proof that the, the victim had sexual intercourse at a certain point in time, right? It is, tr it yeah. Probably it, shows, right? It, uh, it definitely shows that the victim had sexual intercourse at some point in time. It does not show that, that uh, Mr. Sharp is uh, the source of the pregnancy. So it only shows like one piece of the puzzle and it's very well, often we let in evidence when it shows one piece of the puzzle and then there's other pieces of the puzzle and the bricks in the wall or however you want to describe it where a, a party builds their case right uh, in this particular case yes your honor that is true but in this particular case we need to be a little bit careful because here the pregnancy the record does not show that uh, that mr. sharp is the source of the pregnancy and that's problematic because at that point, it looks like the pregnancy is evidence of other sexual conduct. When you, when you add down to the picture the abortion evidence and the fact that he apparently paid for half of the abortion cost, doesn't that continue to add some puzzle pieces? The problem with um, his offer to pay or his payment of half of the cost of the abortion is that the probative value of that can be read both ways. It either shows consciousness of guilt uh, which is an inference I don't agree um, with, or it shows his acting out of familial obligation. So the probate about- for the jury to decide? Well, actually it's, it's for uh, the judge to conclude, and the judge concluded that, uh, that it should be excluded under Rule 403, or it's, it's irrelevant. So the judge did make that evidentiary determination, and uh, because of the deferential standard that is in place, I think we have to defer to the trial court's determination. It was simply within the principled range of, of, of reasonable outcomes here. But really, Your Honor, to, to, to address your question about the pregnancy, there are two alleged incidents at issue. One incident took place or allegedly took place at DM's mother's house, and the timing for that is, um, is mixed based on the record below. It either took place in December 2013, January 14, and if that were the case, it could not have been the source of the pregnancy, which came up in October 2014, or it took place um, December 2014 and January 2015, and that's post-dating the pregnancy and abortion. So that's at the door. The question is, is when did the alleged incident at Mr. Sharp's residence take place? And nobody, t uh, DM did not testify as to the date of that. For all we know, that could have taken place after the abortion. And for these reasons, at that point, if that is true, the pregnancy and abortion is subject to the rape shield statute and is simply evidence of, of other sexual conduct. And that evidence or that evidentiary determination should be made at the outset of, of trial. I certainly don't think that the jury should get to be the gatekeeper of evidence um, under, under the rape shield statute. And um, with respect to the, um, uh, the lack of, of, of prior sexual uh, conduct, I would also argue that, um, that it does comport with, with um, not only does it subvert the purpose of the rape shield statute, but um, definitionally, I think uh, the plain text of uh, the statute supports that conduct includes lack of sexual conduct. Unless there are any other questions, I'd like to save the rest of my time for rebuttal. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't want you to have seven minutes. That's half of your entire argument, and that's altering the uh, sequence of the argument today. Would you, I'll give you five minutes. Sure. Good morning. May it please the court, Madonna Blanchard, Assistant Wayne County Prosecutor on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. This court should affirm the Court of Appeals opinion because it is not clearly erroneous, erroneous and it does not conflict with Michigan jurisprudence. First, this court's precedent, as followed by the Court of Appeals in this case, holds that the rape shield statute does not apply to evidence related to the underlying offense. The evidence the people seek to introduce directly relates to one of the underlying charges. Therefore, the rape shield statute does not apply. Here, we have a victim who turned 14 years old on July 21st, 2014. And one night, when she was 14, defendants sexually assaulted her. 
Then, on October 6, 2014, she finds out she's pregnant. Evidence of the victim's pregnancy will corroborate the victim's testimony that the defendant sexually assaulted her. Evidence that the victim had no other sexual partners from around the time of the assault until the time she discovered she was pregnant is evidence that the defendant caused the victim's pregnancy. And evidence that the victim subsequently had an abortion, which defendant paid for half of, directly relates to the defendant's consciousness of guilt in the, in the underlying assault. Second, even if this court finds that the rape shield statute applies, the Court of Appeals correctly held that the evidence would be admissible under the statute's exceptions. Evidence of the victim's lack of other sexual partners during the pertinent period is relevant to show that the defendant was the source of the victim's pregnancy. And evidence of the pregnancy and abortion is admissible because it is evidence of the victim's past sexual conduct with the actor. Third, the probative value of the evidence is not outweighed by unfair prejudice. The evidence that the 14-year-old victim became pregnant during the time defendant sexually assaulted her, and during that time she had no other sexual partners, and that she was able to abort her pregnancy through the defendant's financial help is highly probative evidence directly relating to the charged defense that makes more likely the fact that the defendant was the perpetrator. Therefore, the people ask this court to affirm the Court of Appeals' opinion, and I stand for any questions. Um, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to direct the court to the record, which clearly states what the, prosecu the trial prosecutor in this case is trying to introduce in into evidence in this case, as this is an interlocutory appeal. She states, so what I intend to ask the victim, if your honor allows it, is during the time in which you got pregnant, the time in which the defendant was having sex with you, did you have sex with anybody else? And I expect her answer to be no. And that will help the jury to decide whether the defendant is the one who impregnated her. That is a very limited scope of Are time. You, uh, aren't you concerned that by offering this type of evidence, you're gonna open up the complaining witness to all of the types of inquiries that the Rape Shield Act was designed to prevent? Well, the Rape Shield Statute, yes, is trying to prevent certain inquiries, but it allows for specific in inquiries that the defendant is allowed to present to the court as an offer of proof, and then the court would decide whether that evidence would be relevant or not. Could the defendant just, you know, as this court has called it, a fishing expedition and just ask her random questions about whether she did or did not have prior sexual conduct or sexual conduct during that time period? No, but if he did have evidence that would show the source of her pregnancy that was somebody else other than him, the rape shield statute specifically allows him to admit that sort of evidence. He would have to provide an offer of proof and the court would make that determination. If that's what the, the rape shield statute allows for. The broader evidence of having no sexual partners sort of opens the complaining witness up to a broader inquiry, does it not? It does, and I, and I think that the reason why I direct the court to the record is I think that maybe perhaps myself, the Court of Appeals, and the language maybe, the language used was slightly more broad as it relates to the defendant or the victim's lack of sexual partners. But what both my, in my briefing and the Court of Appeals notes is that it's the lack of sexual partners during the time to show her source of pregnancy. Her, to, to, to ask the victim a question whether she had no sexual partners in January 2014, would obviously be irrelevant and, and inadmissible to show her source of pregnancy in October 6, 2014, because she wouldn't have been able to abort that. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And with the trial prosecutor in this case, she was not asking to allow evidence of her general lack of sexual partners. As she states, she, would, she intends to ask her whether during the time she was having sex with the defendant, did she have sex with anybody else? So it's in that limited time frame. Now, if opposing counsel brings evidence that also during that time frame, she was sexually active with another person, and that person comes in and testifies, as they've done in other cases, then that is permissible under the rape shield statute to show the source of pregnancy with somebody else. But that doesn't prohibit us from allowing the prosecutor to ask this question because the rape shield statute is not triggered by showing, to, by providing evidence directly related to the underlying offense, that she had no other sexual partners other than the defendant which would then lead to the pregnancy, which is obviously admissible because she's saying that during the time period that she was having, uh, where, when defendant sexually assaulted her, she shortly thereafter discovered she was pregnant. That is directly related to the assault that the people are intending to, sh to present to the jury. To not allow that would be that we're not able to present evidence directly related to this offense. 
And this court has repeatedly held that. What's your textual basis for saying that evidence can't be introduced that's directly related to the offense? Where is that, where is that developed in the language of the Rape Shield Act? Well, the, when this court has interpreted and applied the Rape Shield Statute and its purpose, both, both in People v. Arenda and People v. Adair, the court has stated that the purpose of the Rape Shield Statute is to, to prohibit evidence of the victim's sexual conduct unrelated to the underlying offense. Well, you resist the idea that the victim's sexual conduct is not implicated in those instances in which the victim is assaulted or raped by somebody else. I do resist that idea. I think that... Which seems to me to be the principal textual support for the argument that you're making on the basis of some vague and broad purpose underlying the statute. No, I, 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 with all due respect, Your Honor, I, I disagree. I think that the broad purpose of the statute was to prohibit inquiries into a victim's prior sexual, or into specific instances of her sexual conduct. The purpose of the statute is defined by its language, and the purpose of the statute by that point of view is to preclude evidence that pertains to the victim's sexual conduct. So depending on how you interpret the victim's sexual conduct, evidence is either admissible or inadmissible. That would seem to me to be the better way of looking at the statute than trying to identify what you, you perceive the purpose of the statute to be. Well, limiting it to just that, then I, I would argue then the Rape Shield Statute under that very narrow and limited understanding of the statute would then apply, and then this evidence would be admissible because it's evidence of the... But you really don't want to accept that definition because the more typical presentation of these cases is that it would be the defendant arguing for a more narrow under, narrower understanding of victim's sexual conduct. This is that rare case in which the prosecutor is arguing for that. Is that not correct? I don't want to accept that interpretation because I, I think it directly contradicts the purpose of the statute. Under that theory, as it applies to this case, then the people would have to also provide an offer of proof and a preliminary in, motion eliminating hearing regarding every instant or every piece of the victim's testimony because her testimony in and of itself of sexual assault would be then applicable under the Rape Shield Statute. That means the Rape Shield Statute would apply and then the court would have to make a determination preliminarily whether this would, there would be some sort of exception under the statute that she can even testify in relationship to the assault that the people have charged against the defendant. I don't, I think there's nothing that would support that that is the intent of the statute, that the people would have to, in a motion eliminating hearing, by piecemeal present all the evidence outside of the jury to a judge to make a preliminary finding of whether that evidence would be admissible under one of the exceptions of the statute. It wouldn't be limited to just the pregnancy or abortion or lack of sexual partners. Her very testimony regarding the very assault for which defendant is charged with would be a specific instance of sexual conduct. And I don't think that there's anything to support the idea that that is what the legislature intended and there's nothing to support that in this court's precedent which has consistently held that the Rape Shield Statute applies to offenses unrelated to the underlying offense. It just might be that an understanding of the victim's sexual conduct is that when she is assaulted by someone else that it involves the sexual conduct of the assaulter and not the sexual conduct of the victim. I don't, I don't agree with that. It would, if she's assaulted by somebody else, it would also then bring in testimony that she was the victim who was participating in that sexual conduct. I don't, I don't see how that would apply here. Maybe in another situation, to allow the Rape Shield Statute to apply here, it wouldn't be just limited to pregnancy or abortion. It would be any evidence related to the specific instance of her conduct. And I don't, I don't think that applies. And then even your understanding of conduct to perhaps mean to not include involuntary conduct, I don't think that that is what this court has held. And it doesn't even need to go there because this court, as it held in People v. Arenda and People v. Adair, that the Rape Shield Statute applies to cases unrelated to the underlying offense. So this court doesn't need to define the word conduct or whether it applies in this specific instance because the court has repeatedly held it doesn't apply to the underlying offense. And it just, 
it doesn't need to take the next step into defining conduct to see whether it applies in this specific circumstance because it is related to the underlying offense. I know opposing counsel takes issue with the offer of proof at the preliminary examination and how it's unclear about the dates and the timing. The fact of the matter is, is that this is an interlocutory appeal. All that could be fleshed out at trial. What we have to focus on is on the trial prosecutor's offer of proof. And we can also look at the preliminary exam testimony where the victim indicates that she was 14 years old when this happened and that she went to school the next day, school had started, and then shortly thereafter, October 6th, she finds out she was pregnant. There was another assault, and the timing of that other assault, unrelated to this, the pregnancy and abortion at issue, it is unclear from the preliminary examination what the time, over what time period it happened. The mother had, um, it, she said 2013, 2014, or 2014, 2015, or 15, but the one, the assault that's related to the pregnancy and abortion seems pretty clear, and if there was any doubt as to whether it related directly to the pregnancy, and that we can all agree that if it is related to the underlying offense, then the rape statute doesn't apply, then all that would mean would be the trial, we would ask the trial court to ask, demand a further offer of proof by the people to show a sufficient uh, relation to the evidence we're trying to propose to support its, the, the relevancy. It wouldn't be that the evidence would be excluded. It would be a more offer of proof would have to be provided by the trial prosecutor. Um, as to um, opposing counsel's um, argument about the right to confrontation, this court has held that the rape shield statute would yield to a defendant's right to confrontation if, uh, under certain circumstances, and there's a weighing that uh, the courts would have to do when, when that issue presents itself. We can't exclude evidence on the possibility that the defendant's right to confrontation may possibly be infringed if he was able to find evidence and was unable to present it at trial. That's another question for this court that, that it would have to decide. It would have to determine if this court admits this evidence and the defendant does have evidence he would like to introduce, then at that time the court can determine whether, one, it would be admissible under one of the exceptions of the rape shield statute, which based on his suggestion of the type of evidence he would think that he would, could be um, admissible, the rape shield statute allows for it. If it didn't, then as this court has stated in People v. Hackett, there are certain steps that he can take, and the court can determine whether that evidence would be admissible and would yield to the, um, the societal interest that the rape shield statute protects to protect the defendant's right to confrontation. Th none of that is here yet. We don't know what type of evidence he intends to present, and if that happens, then that's another decision for the court to make. But what we have here is a trial court who clearly abuses discretion. The reasoning why it didn't uh, admit evidence of the victim's other sexual partners during the time of the assault was merely because she could have been sexually active. That, that is not enough. The point is, is that that evidence is relevant to show the source of her pregnancy and to allow the pregnancy, but not to allow the fact that she had no other sexual partners during this specific time period. The relevancy of, of that evidence strongly outweighs any prejudicial effect. And if she did have other sexual partners, in fact, well, that evidence can most certainly be admitted under the rape shield statute. The evidence of the pregnancy most certainly corroborates the victim's testimony that she was sexually assaulted, and the abortion follows that. The jury would be left wondering, where is the DNA? Where is the child? To not tell the jury what happened to that w would leave everybody wondering. And even if it could be, in some circumstances, possibly prejudicial just in and of itself, the fact that she um, had an abortion, although a lot of evidence is admitted that contradicts people's personal beliefs, but juries are instructed to leave their bias and personal opinions at the door. And that instruction should suffice, but here what would outweigh any prejudice in the probative value of the abortion is the fact that he paid for it. And if he did it based on a, a familial obligation, well, that's a question or an argument that would be made to the jury. It, it, that's not a reason why the evidence would be inadmissible. Hmm. What meaning would you give to the word specific? I think specific means something happened. It's a specific instance of sexual conduct. It, hmm. Not For it to not have existed, I, I can't see specific any other way. Specific means something happened, and I, I define that in my brief. Specific means that there is something 
to, to tell. And to say that she had no sexual partners, I think that specific instance of sexual conduct is excluded under that language of the statute. But more broadly, the fact that she had a lack of sexual partners during this time period to show the source of her pregnancy and abortion, all related to the underlying assault, would make the rape shield statute inapplicable as a whole. And for the main purpose of having this procedural uh, aspect of the statute that has never been held before, where then the prosecutor would be subjected to the rape statute, rape shield statute in every sexual assault, unlimited to just pregnancy or abortion, to say that the rape shield statute applies when trying to prove the underlying assault seems just impractical. Impractical. Any questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. The people ask that the court affirm the Court of Appeals decision. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there are a few points I would like to address. Uh, the first is uh, counsel suggested that the jury will be left wondering as to why uh, there is no DNA evidence of the, uh, of the abortion. And I think uh, the abortion is not necessary. We can have uh, uh, an, an instruction to the jury, something along the lines of um, um, the complaint did not carry the pregnancy to term, so you don't have to worry about the abortion. And if the, if the court concluded that the pregnancy was indeed admissible, I mean, that is one way of allowing the pregnancy to be admissible and excluding evidence of the abortion. So um, there, there definitely is a way around that. Um, with respect to the probative value of the abortion, I would still argue that is really limited. I mean, at best, there are competing inferences that can be made um, or that can be inferred from, from Mr. Sharp's offer to pay for half of the abortion um, cost, and, and there is no DNA evidence. So there is a very minimal probative value. With respect to the argument that the cross-examination or the right to confrontation argument can be addressed at a later date, uh, respectfully, I, I disagree with that. I think, however, this court um, comes out on this particular issue, it is going to have a ripple effect across all trial, um, across the state. And trial courts will be left wondering as to what to do in a particular instance when it admits evidence of lack of prior sexual conduct. And, and you can see um, trial judges coming out differently. So I do uh, respectfully request the court to, uh, to consider uh, the Sixth Amendment issue and that is definitely in the picture and to not save it for another, another day. And um, counsel has argued that, that, the, that the precise request made before the trial court was uh, to ask the question as to whether DM had sexual um, partners during the duration she was um, allegedly assaulted by, by Mr. Sharp. That is true. However, it seems to me, based on the appellate briefing um, before the Michigan Court of Appeals, um, that time frame was expanded to include, um, so the term virginity is used, which suggests that lack of prior sexual conduct during the duration of a person's life. So somewhere along the way in this process, uh, that time frame was expanded. Um, and if you look at the actual holding of the Court of Appeals decision, um, the Court of Appeals does not uh, limit its holding to to just the time frame. So I would just ask this court to be to be mindful of that. Um, with with respect to the argument made that, that that the pregnancy is indeed related to the the underlying conduct, um, that is just an assumption that the prosecution is asking the court to make without any facts to support it. Certainly, if, uh, if the defendant were, um, were doing something similar, offering evidence of a venereal disease or offering that somebody else was the source of the pregnancy, we would expect uh, the defendant to um, produce and proffer competent evidence. That was not done here. I think in a rush judgment, the trial court did allow admission of uh, the pregnancy evidence without really determining the threshold inquiry as to is there any support or factual support to conclude 
um, that the pregnancy is indeed incident to the alleged rape such that it would not be subject to um, the rape shield statute. And as for the argument that um, uh, that this that this issue could be fleshed out trial respectfully, I disagree with that as well. It was the prosecution that brought the issue to the table at the outset that sought to admit evidence of the lack of prior sexual conduct, the pregnancy and abortion, and it didn't deliver. Uh, so to argue that it can somehow fix the issue later on, I, I just think it's going to uh, um, just uh, waste more time. And unless there are any other further questions. Thank you, Council. This case will be submitted.